Log Talk Radio. Paranormal Review Radio. without commercials and with more great paranormal talk. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Anthony Agati in New York. And I'm Lucy Liebfried in Chicago. You're listening to one of the highest rated paranormal radio shows on Blog Talk. No bull, no lies, just a true platform for everyone to share their knowledge and experience. When searching for the truth, good communication is key. Now, our phone lines are open for questions or stories. The number to call is 661-244-9831. Make sure you press the number 1 to get into the queue. We'll try to get to you as soon as we can. Otherwise, our chat room is open so you can post any comments or questions there as well. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Paranormal Review Radio. You'll find more articles, blogs, and full show uploads. And if you have specific questions, comments, or would like to be a guest on the show, email us at paranormal.review at aol.com. Now, sit back, get comfy, and prepare to open your mind. It's time for Paranormal Review Radio. (laughs) Many er urban... What are you laughing at? Many urban (laughs) legends and uh, many horror movies and books are geared to make your life a little unnerving and unsettling. They tug on the inner fear we all possess and sometimes actually don't admit to. But many of these are untrue stories or just made-up lines. When a scary story is true and factual, now you're talking about something different. You are now on a completely different level and dimension of unnerving. Tonight, Lucy and I scoured the Internet, researching and digging up some of the most horrid and unbelievable and the downright wretched true scary stories that you may not believe existed or in some cases still exist to this day. The purpose of tonight's show is not only to instill fear or horror in our audience. That's going to happen no matter what we talk about. It's more about informing and alerting our valued listeners about such cases. With this knowledge, it may help you possibly understand the paranormal world a bit more, but more importantly, it may help you value the things you hold dear to your heart. Just a little about our research. We pulled our facts from reputable sites and journals. These were not just taken from Wikipedia or blog-based sites. We made sure that many of these facts were true and that they were cross-checked with uh, other sites uh, and journals for accuracy. There may be some errors in these stories, so we ask that if something is not believable to you, research it. Go out there and research it for yourself. We'd love to know and let us know what you find if things come out differently. So with that said, let's begin with some of the scariest true, true stories and facts uh, in the world. Lucy, without, without specifics or getting into specifics and details, um, I know I had uh, given you this list, and mm-hmm. uh, we, we um, worked together on you know, creating tonight's show, but what do you think about the stories uh, that we're going to talk about tonight? What do you think, what was going through your mind as you were going through them and researching them on your own? A couple of them I already knew about. I mean, a couple of them were, like, kind of like my favorite ones, like especially the the Island of the Dolls in Mexico. Um, Mm -hmm. But there's a couple other ones that I had no idea, 
And then when I started reading and researching about it, it's like, wow, this is like really, really weird. And then there's a couple. There's there's one in particular that the more I learned about it, I just kept going, mm hmm, mm hmm, yep, I believe this. So we'll see. Well, what made them believable for you? What, uh, uh, don't don't say the story yet because I want to give out the show just in the first two seconds. But uh, <laughs> what made it what made it believable to you? Did did, did all of the, the facts and the stories, I guess, become familiar with your experience in the paranormal, or was it just believable? Yeah. Just believable. No, it's believable because of one experience in the paranormal, but then also two, with a little bit of knowledge of history and the things that have transpired. And it kind of makes sense that maybe this is has happened or it did happen. I mean, we always research the land. We always research the history when we go somewhere. And it was just, it was kind of like this one particular story to me, which is kind of like doing an investigation without actually going to the site. Hmm. And I enjoyed that. I loved that. Well, you know, we we, we have 20 scary facts to go over tonight. Um, it, uh, you know, I can be completely honest. It, it was a a long, long week for both Lucy and I. Um, yes. And uh, you know, we did all the research and we got everything together. But you know, it's not perfect. Meaning that you know, we didn't memorize everything. You know, obviously, twenty scary facts to know about all those stories. Uh, you'd have to do months and months of research to to put this all together and combine it in a way and, and rehearse it all. So you may hear us reading some of these stories word for word, which I think is actually good because it's showing that we're pulling it from factual information and not just making it up. Uh, but some of them, um, you know, they 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 they. I don't know. I, I just after reading it, you know, I pretty much understood the entire story. Um, and mm-hmm. can can review it, you know, without having to read it at all. So I know we have a list, Lucy. We have 20 uh, scary facts and scary true facts, factual stories to go over. Um, and I know I had put them in a list of 1 to 20. Do you want to, though, go off and pull the ones that you like the most? Because as this is a two-hour show, I'm not sure if we're going to actually get through 20 of them, because there's a lot to talk about in each of them. But uh, why don't why don't we try and pull the ones that we liked or that are were interesting to us, if you want, and um, we can go from there. Did you want to pull one first? Um, yeah. Um, let's let's go. You know, actually, the second one that you listed, Tamerlane's Curse. I found mm-hmm. this one interesting. Maybe not so much scary, but it was really really interesting because I didn't realize the extent of you know. It, 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 I, it just, to me, it seemed like a curse. Everything that fell into place kind of seemed like this could be real. So let's get to that one. Um, Tamerlan's Curse. This is, it has well, to, to do. Yeah, it, it, it it's... It's about a, a uh, just to put it a, a little bit of in, in a nutshell, um, a Timurid, um, who created the Timurid dynasty. Uh, I, I, and again, I'm not even sure. This one actually doesn't even have the date. Um, but you can Google I Timurid. Have. You have the date, actually? I have the date. I just the Timur- Timurid dynasty uh, extends within Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, um, Kazakhstan, and... He was a ruthless, ruthless leader, and uh, almost to the point of barbaric. And when he died, uh, they entombed him and inscripted stuff on his tomb, which we'll get into. And this tomb was opened up and released in 1941, I want to say, sorry, yes, 1941. And um, something was released, which we'll get into. But go ahead, Lucy. What were you going to say? Okay. Well, okay. It happened in the 14th century. And Timur is a Mongol invader. He was descended from Genghis Khan. Um, he was intent on rebuilding uh, the empire that Khan initially conquered. 
and he the empire he created was the Timurid dynasty. And this dynasty, I mean, when you think about it, it covered Turkey, Iran, Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, something, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, India, and even Russia. Seven, over 17 million people were killed in the process of him conquering all this land. Timur even decided he was going to conquer China. Okay? Now, most of his, most of his conquests, they all happened in the spring. That must have been conquering season. When he decided that he was going to conquer China, he did it in the winter, which was his downfall. According to what I had read, um, that winter ended up being the cold, one of the coldest winters registered on Earth in the year 1405. Now, how if, if they were tracking weather back then, I'm not sure. that I found that kind of weird. But yeah. according to this, this is one of the coldest weather. Um, just the fact with, you know, everything that happened, Timur just gave up. I mean, it was too cold. It was too hard for them to go. And, and I'm he was assuming old. that the Chinese. He was old. He he was uh he eventually died at age 68. He was in his 60s when he undertook this. So right. at that point, he died. Okay. So Timur was born in Samarkand, Uzbekistan, and his body was taken back, and they built a tomb, and that's where he was buried. On his tombstone. Okay, there's an inscription, and the inscription reads, When I rise from the dead, the world shall tremble. Whoever disturbs my tomb, I'm sorry, whoever disturbs my tomb will unleash, there it is, will unleash an invader more terrible than I. And that's what's written on his tomb. So, you have this tomb in Uzbekistan, and it's got this this foreboding message on there. When in 1941, Joseph Stalin decided he was he ordered the opening of the tomb of Timur. Timur's face was reconstructed from his skull by a Russian anthropologist, and on June 20th, 1941, they opened up the tomb. When they opened up the tomb. There was the choking, and I say quote in quotes, choking order of frankincense, rose, camphor, and resin. Now, they thought this was the the curse being released, and actually, what it ended up being is that it's a lot of the materials that they used to embalm the the mummy. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, now, before they did this, okay, there were people in the area. There were three elderly people and the Muslim clergy in the area. They warned Stalin's people that this tomb was cursed. They also said that a curse would start three days after they opened it. Needless to say, Stalin's people never never listened to it. Okay, so now this is June 20th when they opened the tomb. On June 22nd, Nazi Germany, Germany invaded Russia without a formal declaration of war. At this time, Timur's remains had been shipped up to Moscow. All the while that the remains were in Russia, the Germans were winning. They prevailed. It got to the point where Stalin must have believed that this curse was real because he ordered the remains to be sent back to the tomb. This happened on June, uh, December 20th, 1942. This is when the remains got sent back. Now, shortly after those remains were sent back, the German forces surrendered after the Soviets won the Battle of Stalingrad. And this is considered to be one of the bloodiest battles of World War II. The plane that actually was taking these remains back actually made a detour out of their path and flew over the, uh, the, uh, they made a circle over Stalingrad. So was this really a curse? All the while Timur's remains were in Russia, things were going good. The minute they sent them back, then all of a sudden they won. 
Is it a curse? I kind of believe it is. You know, it's also, too, that they some people um, had proclaimed that because the inscription says whoever opens up this tomb um, will, uh, let me just get it right. Unleash an invader worse than I am. Right. Uh, when I rise from the dead, the world shall tremble, and it shall release a, a, a or unleash an invader more ter- terrible than I. And some have equated that to possibly uh, Adolf Hitler, because at this time, this is World War II. Uh, this is right smack in the middle of World War II. And so um, m- many scholars have, uh, who have studied this story have equated the curse or the, the unleashing of, of an invader more terrible than Timur as being Adolf Hitler. And so that's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. And n- nobody has um, gone back to this case and investigated even further. I believe it's in, he's back in his tomb and back in Russia and uh, nobody has dared to actually open up this box again. Um, it kind of reminds me of the movie The Mummy and uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the unleashing of, of the, the curses and spirits. And there's so many stories out there, especially in Egypt, obviously, of uh, King Tut's tomb and uh, all of the curses that lay upon someone who, who opens up the sarcophagus and releases or handles the body of any of them uh, that, that a curse is released. So who knows? Um, you know, I, I don't know if it is coincidence or not. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on it, but it's an interesting story um, and one probably that you may not have heard about before. And so uh, I thought it was pretty cool. Well, think about it. Think about it in other cultures. When you talk about burial grounds, especially with Native American, when you talk about burial grounds, when you talk about um, cemeteries, this is sacred land. And in order to, like, disturb it or to go in there, so you know, people tend to believe that things happen. So who knows? Is this really a curse or is it just a coincidence that all this stuff happened? I'm... I'm going to say that I kind of believe that it could be a curse. I think Timur got a little bit upset. (laughs) Well, you know, um, the next story that we have um, that I wanted to talk about, which I thought was really freaky, was the Brazilian boy coming back from the dead. Mm, Now. We, we've heard stories, and I'm sure many of you out there are listening and, and watching on YouTube, uh, that the stories of, and people probably have even thought this while at a funeral, you know, thinking that their beloved deceased one that is in the coffin uh, will wake up. Or you may have thought that the body moved while you were actually sitting in the wake um, at the funeral. But um, this story actually was true, and it actually happened. So the story goes like this. In, um, in Brazil, in, in the year 2012, there was a two-year-old boy um, that had died. And uh, he had died in the accounts of um, lo- losing his breath or, or something to the effect of with his lungs and pneumonia. And um, the hospital released the body to the parents, on a Friday, and that night they stayed up vigil and, uh, you know, invited their friends and family to come over to have this wake for the, the, the baby boy, and the next day they were going to do the burial. Well, during the course of the evening, the two-year-old deceased boy that was laying in a coffin box in the home, in his home, uh, at had risen up from the coffin and said to his father, Daddy, can I have some water? He quickly then went back down into the coffin, but was still alive. The parents brought him back to the hospital, and uh, within an hour or so, the doctors could not save him or did not save him, and the boy died, I guess you can say the boy died again. Um, 
and I'm going to just check and see. Sorry, they just actually said that uh, they re-examined the boy and confirmed that he had no signs of life. So, um, obviously, the parents were upset and and uh, and angry at this and angry at the hospital because they think that the boy was actually alive um, when mm-hmm. they first brought him home and are now um, putting a case against the hospital. But that is one of the most freakiest things that I have heard of being true. Now, we've all heard those stories of things like this happening, but uh, there was no accounts or, or no way of, of verifying any of them. Uh, this one is verifiable because it is on record, it is on hospital records, and, um, and you know, all, obviously all of the witnesses that were in the home at that time. But that was a, that's, a, that's a freaky story to actually... Could you imagine having your child wake up like that and say something now I've heard, you know, when when you die, your your muscle uh, muscle spasm, and your your body contracts. It's getting out. It's releasing that energy uh, a- after after you die. Your bodies are uh, penting up that energy at the moment of death, and then it re- it releases at some point. There's that that motion that happens with your muscles after death. Um, but this boy physically rose straight out of the coffin and asks his, his father for a glass of water. Um, I thought that was freaky. It's freaky, but we're talking about Brazil, okay? And the father is convinced that this is a case of medical malpractice. He said that when um, 15 minutes after rushing him away for recitation, they came and told me he was dead and they handed me his body. Okay. He, you know, it's very possible, and the only reason why I say this is because I have had experience with medical treatment in a South American, in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Not exactly the best, okay? It's not exactly the same level of treatment that we get here. In my mind, it is a possibility that there could have been a mistake that they declared this poor child dead and... I think that might be it, because for the fact for this poor child to sit up and say, Daddy, he spoke. It's not just rigor mortis happening here. This child sat up and spoke. So I think it's horrible what happened to these parents. I mean, I I can't imagine this, but on this one, I'm going to kind of side with the dad and said it's very possible this is some kind of medical malpractice. It really is. And I'm only saying that because hospitals in Mexico are really, really dicey. I mean, if you're going to have something done, like I, I read about all these people that go to Mexico to get, like, um, treatments and to get, like, you know, uh, plastic surgery and stuff. It's like, oh, my God, why? Why are you doing this? <laughs> the, to me, that's more scary. That's more frightening to go down there and get medical treatment than anything else. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard of stories of people going to Cuba uh, because it's much cheaper. Um, mm-hmm. Also, too, you know, going there. But, it, it, you know, it just, it, I don't know. It, wouldn't, wouldn't, all right, let's just say, let's just take the hospitals out of the uh, hospital out of the equation. You know, you're you're holding your supposed dead child for the first time as the hospital hands them to you and bringing them home to then um, have this funeral in your home with family and friends. Wouldn't you think that the boy was still alive? Wouldn't you feel that the boy was still alive? You know, obviously the boy had to have been breathing still. And so, I don't know. I I, I would assume that you would realize it, that, that uh, your son is is still breathing. He's still alive. I, I don't oh, want to be wrong. like, I don't want to be morbid or anything like that, but have you ever really, like, touched a dead person? Yes. Okay. When my father passed away, this was in the hospital, and they had shut off. He was on life support, and they shut it off. I held his hand all the way until they had a they had to pull me out of there. Yes, you can feel the life leave the body. It's hard to explain. It's it's something I can't. I can't put into words. So, uh, 
I'm assuming because his father, they carried this baby. They carried this baby home. Someone put him in, you know, they had, they cleaned him up. They, they probably dressed him. They probably put him in the, in, in the coffin and it was an open coffin in the front room. Yeah. But then again, I'm not a doctor. I don't know about these things. But it's very possible that he, I, I, I don't know. There is a way, I mean, there is a feeling that you get when life leaves the body. You can feel it. And they become cold and they become, it's just, I can't describe it. I just can't well, describe I, it. No, I know. And, and that's exactly what I was, you know, sort of getting at. You would know if, you know, your right. loved one is dead. And, and you know, whether it be shallow breathing, um, it's still breathing that you can, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm reading into it too much, you know. I'm just thinking I'm putting myself in their shoes and, and uh, you know, being of sound mind right now, this is what I'm thinking. But, you know, uh, if you're in that moment, you're not thinking clear. You're not thinking No, straight. you're not. So, I, you know, I, I can understand it. But it, it's just, um, you know, uh, out of all the people that were at the funeral, you know, did not one think or see anything? I don't know. I'm just putting doubt out there. That's me. I put doubt. Sharon just posted in in um, chat. That is why they sat in the parlor with the body to make sure they didn't wake up. Probably. So, and forgive me for sounding dumb, but is this why we call them wakes? Is is that the purpose of it? Is that to have the body I, sit there? I believe so. I believe so. The idea is to um, sit with the dead to. Um, well, it, I think it was for two reasons. Uh, one was so that to see if there was a last chance for life mm-hmm. back. Uh, but two was to make sure that they were dead. That they were and, dead. Uh, yeah, it's sort of you know sitting vigil and 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 watching to make sure that uh, nothing changed in the moments after quote unquote death that they actually um, were dead. And it was a verification sort of you know vetting to make sure that they were dead. Back in the day. Oh. This one, this one is a big question. I mean, I know it, this one is horrible. This one is scary. Just from the thought of, God, what would you do if that happens? You know, I mean, what would you do? I mean, I, I have no idea. I would lose it. I would go insane. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. So I don't know. That one, that one's got a big question mark for me. All right, so. That's the second one. What's uh, what's your next one? Well, let's talk about the uh, Orang Medan. I the, the I, I wanted to talk about that. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. This one. I, this I actually one have is... I have a theory. Well, not a theory, but I have something that I can add to it that's current day, which is which is interesting. Go ahead. Okay. There's a bunch of theories on this one, but basically, what it is. Okay. In June of 1947. And it's called, it's called the Orang Meeting Mystery. Okay, of course, I mispronounce everything. <laughs> in June of 1947, and according to some accounts, it might be February 1948, there is an area that is between Sumatra and Malaysia, and ships traveled the trade routes back and forth. Um, it's called the Straits of Malacca. Right. And ships that were in the area were getting a series of SOS distress signals. And the message was in Morse code, and it came across all officers, including captain, are dead, lying in the chart room and bridge. Possibly a whole crew is dead. There's a few more words that came across. They don't know what they were. They couldn't make them out. And then finally, there was one last message, and it said, I die. Nothing else came across after that. Nothing. Um there were two American ships that were in the area. There were British and Dutch, Dutch listening posts that all heard these distress calls. The listening post managed to figure out the calls may be coming from a Dutch freighter, which was known as the Orang Meden. Um, it was sailing in the area, and the closest ship that was there was an American merchant ship called the Silver Star. So they were dispatched to this area to try to see what was what. As they got closer, they saw the ship. 
The Silver Star, the American ship, noticed that there was no, no signs of life on the deck. Nothing. As they got closer, they decided they were going to board to try to find out what went, uh, what happened. The boarding party found the crew filled with the bodies of the Dutch crew. Now, all of these bodies had their eyes wide open, like they were staring at something. Um, at the sun faces, or at the sky? At the Well, the, something. And right. their faces were frozen in in terror. The uh, They were just frozen in agony and terror. The arms were reaching up as if they were fighting something off. Even the dog, the ship's dog, was dead, and his face was frozen in a snarl. The captain's remains were found on the bridge, and, but his officers were strewn about the wheelhouse and the chart room. The communications officer, the guy who was sending the Morse code, was found with his fingers still on the um, telegraph. Telegraph. And mm-hmm. all of these bodies had all the same look on their face, all of them. Um, the Americans noticed that when they got into the hole of the boat, that it was cold, that it was freezing. But the temperature outside was about 110 degrees. Um It's pretty obvious to them that these people were suffering a lot when they died. The Silver Star decided they were going to tow the Orang Medan, but then they noticed that there was smoke coming out from the lower decks. They barely had time to make it back to their own ship before this, the the Orang Medan, exploded with such a force, and I quote, it lifted herself up from the water and swiftly sank. So, here's where the mystery comes in. What happened? What could kill all of these sailors, all of these people on this boat, where they're all frozen in terror, and they're all reaching up like they're trying to fight something off? What could happen? What could cause this ship to explode like that? There, There's a gamut of different uh, theories out there, you know, from the paranormal to the scientific. And Mm -hmm. um, one in particular had mentioned something about the specific cargo that, uh, uh, I don't know if they said it was actually found on on the boat or not, but they talked about sort of biohazards, sort of chemicals that were in the cargo bay, and possibly that could have... um, you know, set off some fumes that, uh, you know, basically killed them almost instantly or not instantly but in a horrific way as far as trying to breathe or um, uh, 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 nerves, uh, attacking the nerves, and therefore that that may have created that wide-eyed, horrid, scary look that all of the dead on the ship uh, apparently had. You know, they, they also talked about, uh, people have put out the, the theories about uh, paranormal, that it could have been a UFO of some sort, and um, uh, the whole gamut of, of theories that you can possibly imagine are out there. What do you think happened to it? Well, the thing that I find interesting, and I'm, I'm you know, part of me, you know, as I get older, I get more suspicious, okay? They mentioned Unit 731, and in case you're not right. familiar with Unit 731, it is... Um, uh, the Japanese during the war had um, this area where they were doing their own type of experiments on people. They were doing them on prisoners, on, on, on women, children. Um, you know, people talk about the Nazis and all their experiments. Well, the Japanese also did this. And one of the things that they were experimenting was, uh, with was with, like, nerve gases, uh, like you mentioned, um, chemical warfare. So the theory goes that it's very possible that this ship was actually carrying some of the gases or something that they had experimented with. Now, why would they put it on, you know, maybe even something like nitroglycerin or something like that? Why would this ship, why would this old cargo ship be carrying this? Well, the theory goes is that there's very possible that the Americans, 
the American government had made a deal with the Japanese in order to study this, that they granted them immunity if they would give them the gases or whatever they were experimenting with. Right. And the safest way to take this chemical or whatever this substance was, was not through, they didn't want to take them through like an airplane where it possibly could explode and, and you know, there would be masses of, of, of uh, death. They put it on this old cargo ship and sent it through the strait, the Malacca Strait. That's one theory. And the thing is, what they're, they're thinking is that possibly whatever this chemical or whatever this thing was escaped, and this is what killed these people. You know, it's possible that they could be hallucinating, that when this happened, that, you know, for them to be have this sense of terror and everything like that, that whatever it was that killed them, not only killed them, but it also made them hallucinate at that time so that they thought they were being attacked by something. That's the theory. That's one theory. And that's kind of like, I could see that. When I read the other theories, this one kind of made sense to me, but I'm not totally convinced of that. No. Think? and what I, did you I, 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 I think all of the theories have a valid point. The, the one thing, though, that mm-hmm. people are saying also, too, is that it could have been just a made-up story and a hoax because there's no uh, registration record of of um of the ship itself of the Urang Medan, Medan. Um, there's no registration record of it and so there's nothing that they can backtrack to go on uh you know to see who was on the ship or, or any of that nature but but think okay. about it if you've got a ship that's not registered and it's carrying something that you don't want the rest of the world to find out that true. makes sense true it does no it does make sense um but as i was reading the story and I was looking at the map mm-hmm. of, the, of the Straits of Malacca between mm-hmm. Malaysia and Sumatra. And the point of which where they found the ship and towed it to. If you guys Google the Orang, and it's O-U-R-A-N-G, M-E-D-A-N, mystery. And if you're able to find a map of where the location of this ship was found um, from the distress call, if you look at it, and you look at the map of where flight Malaysia Flight 370 was last known to have communication, it's the exact same spot. The exact same spot. So my theory into this being a mystery of possible paranormal nature just rose up a notch a little bit. Yeah. It just, uh, you know, and again, there's coincidence, there's all of that. I understand that. I get that. Um, but I'm taking these two stories, and I'm putting them together, and I'm trying to figure out what could possibly... We still haven't found Flight M3, uh, Malaysia Flight 370. Uh-huh. We still haven't found... I mean, they just uh, came on the news just this week saying that uh, um, there was a piece of the tail um, found in Africa. Um, they kn- they know it's, it's from a uh, Boeing... 777, I believe, um, which is the same um, airliner, but uh, they don't know yet for sure if it was from Malaysia Flight 370. It's just it, it's just an odd thing to compare to, um, and I found it really interesting and possibly possibly a, a story to look into about the Straits of Malacca and what's going on in this particular area. Well, wasn't there a story this week, too, something about that they said the black box will never be found? I, I didn't hear that. I mean, you know, that's they said that when they were actually, you know, actively searching mm-hmm. for Flight uh, 370. Um, and that's why they, they tried to do the sonars in the very beginning for the first 30 days, because it's, you know, it sort of sinks to the bottom. And there's no way that they're going to actually find it now, because the pinging is not happening anymore. It's only lasts for 30 days in the water. So, yeah, they potentially could never find the, the, the black box. But if they find pieces floating and, uh, you know, somehow is landing um, or is ending up on the shores of the beaches, either of Australia or of Africa, um, at least they'll find out and they'll know this is the plane and it actually went down in the water. They don't know that yet. Well, there's the other theory that they think that maybe it's methane fumes from the bottom of the ocean that caused this. 
Yeah, the bu- methane bubbling that comes up, which uh-huh. happens. That happens in, in the oceans. Um, I, but that would have had to have been a huge methane bubble or bubbles continuously. Um, and, and, you know, talking about the, the noxious fumes and the gaseous, you know, chemical fumes, you've got people that are on the deck that had died. And you mm-hmm. would think that because it's out in the open in the air that the the toxicity of these fumes would have been lessened than if you were down below in the cabins um, or down below the deck um, in the boiler room or something like that. That, uh, you know, there would have been at least, I would have thought, if anything, at least one person alive. Well, you have the telegraph operator, and there's a question in chat. How did the telegraph operator remain? So is it possible because he was just sitting there working the telegraph, he wasn't expending any real energy? Everybody else, obviously, were walking around doing what they can. They're expending energy. They're breathing more. The telegraph operator probably would have been the last one because he's just sitting there. He's not expending any energy. So if these fumes are there it could have hit him last. So he was the last one to be able to move or to function. Right. It's it's an interesting mystery. Um, I don't know if it's completely horror, but uh, it does have some horror elements in, in its story. Well, if it ties to the plane, yeah, it is horror. <laughs> that was just weird. I was just looking at him like, wait a minute. That's the exact same area as as Malaysia Flight 370. Could there be a coincidence? Could there be, you know, um, as Freaky Kate in chat was saying, you know, is it, could it be a Bermuda Triangle? Could there be something mm-hmm. mysteriously paranormal phenomenon of supernatural sort um, within that area that could could have created this this mystery? Something to think about. I didn't notice that, but now you've got me curious, and now I do want to take a look at the maps and compare. Take a look. Take a look. Okay. All right. Where do you want to go into next? What what's the next story? I'm getting into this now. This one <laughs> This one is not so well, it's horror, but it's horror of our own making. What about the mass suicide in Denham? Oh yes. I did not know I about mean, this. this. I and, didn't know this either. And and I'm a history buff. Um you know, even though sometimes I get dates wrong a lot when I talk. But um, I did not, I've did. i never heard of this story or this incident. And this is not, and, and before we get into it, this is not the only occurrence. When I was reading, there was a lot of this that was happening in different areas. But this one in particular just was just horrible. And like I said, this is not anything supernatural. This is, this is horror that is created by man himself, okay? Um, this is during the last weeks of World War II and tens of thousands of Germans committed suicide, especially in the territories that were occupied by the Red Army. The suicides occurred in two stages, uh, a first wave before the Red Army's arrival, part in part due to fear of the Russians. Okay, uh, The Nazis had been spreading propaganda about how horrible they were, how life was going to be. So, of course, they scared the people that lived there. And rather than face, you know, what was coming, families gathered themselves together and they killed themselves. Now, the second wave came after the Red Army got there, and it was triggered by all the the atrocities that they did, the the executions, looting, mass rapes. In 1945, Denham had between 15,000 and 16,000 people that lived there. Thousands of refugees from the east were also in town, so the population doubled. In late April, when the Eastern Front drew closer, women, children, and elderly men were forced to dig a uh, three-and-a-half-mile-long uh, anti-tank ditch. On April 28th, the German flight from the town began. Um, they started evacuating, okay, Um, The Soviet Army got there on uh, April 30th, and at the tower they hoisted a white banner. You know, they were were giving up. 
you know they they so when the i mean when the soviets got there what they did they were looting they were raping they were just doing everything horrible uh whole families decided that they were going to kill each other and the most horrible thing that i read um there was a survivor a four she was 14 years old at the time and the recollection that that she gave she said my mother was also raped and then together with us and the neighbor she hurried towards the river she was going to jump in with my siblings i only realized much later that i had held her back that i had pulled her out what may be called a state of trance to prevent her from jumping into the water there were people there was screaming the people were prepared to die the children were told do you want to live on the town is burning these and those are dead already no we don't want to live anymore so the people threw themselves in the river that made even the russians feel creepy there are examples too where the russians tried to pull people out to stop them but there were hundreds of people and they were unable to re- uh, withhold the population here was extremely panicked that made me feel so bad i can't imagine how horrible this would have been to feel that fear to actually to be a mother and take your children to the river and tr- and drown them because you don't want to to face what's coming i mean this is something that man has done to man this is not anything supernatural this is the horror of war and this to me was very very scary yeah and you know not as i was reading this not uh you know you you would think that they would try and find the easiest means to um commit suicide um you know or the quickest you know jumping out of a building jumping mm-hmm. in a river as you mentioned um but not all of them took that easy route there were a lot of mm-hmm. uh people that you know cut their wrists um and uh, or used a gun or a knife on themselves um it, it was happening daily and and as Lucy was talking about by the thousands because they did not want to face what was happening during World War II and to their their area um it 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 almost seems as though the the town was just consumed um uh just consumed uh, you know you can you can add any adjective after that or or any a uh, descriptive word that you want but they were just consumed and uh, this is their their only way or of means to um to have a peaceful life is to end their life which is which is really sad and as Lucy mentioned earlier also too you know this wasn't this was the largest mass suicide mm-hmm. tens of thousands the largest um but it wasn't the only ones there were thousands of others in other towns uh that were doing this um i think mainly in germany and uh you know there's there there's there's a list here that they gave us you know um i'll, I'll try and read them i hope i don't butcher the the, the cities stolp had about 1000 uh lewenberg uh now it's labork had 600 suicides grunberg uh which is now zielona gora about 500 suicides in berlin there were more than 4000 suicides it just um you know we learn about the atrocities that happened within you know world war Two and the concentration camps and in the front lines and, and all of that um but i've never heard of this story of these mass suicides in the towns you know i always thought you know what were the people thinking about um as this is going on in your town and how they would cope um, and I never read it in, in, obviously you don't read this in your history books in school. Uh, you learn about the other deaths, but not this. Um, and this puts it a little bit more in perspective for me as far as the the, the, the state of mind of of people going through wartime, you know, in, in the 40s and uh, what what they had to go through and what they had to deal with. You know, you've got women and children who were left behind by their fathers and husbands and to fend for themselves as they went into war. And um, this is the the only means that they could cope with what was being left for them to deal with, um, which is a pretty sad story. 
Well, the thing that I find kind of horrible about it, too, is not only what happened, but the fact that this seemed to be like a mass hysteria. I mean, never experiencing anything like this, that's got to be scary, That to the point where so many people have the same fear that it just overcomes a whole town. That, to me, is just, that is scary. That's a scary fact. You know, I, w- I wonder if that would ever happen in this day and age. Do you think there in, would be a mindset of mass hysteria like that, where they would commit suicide, people, mass suicides? You know, think about, the only thing that I can, like, equate this to is, like, you know, burning buildings, okay? And you see the pictures where the fire is coming and people will jump, you know? So at that moment, at that moment where you feel the lesser of two evils, you know, that right. you know that the flames are coming and you're you're, you're going to burn, you may, you take that chance and you jump, you know, does that cross your mind? You know, like instead of burning, I'd rather fall. So I don't know. I mean, my first instinct I would hope is escape. I would think that somehow maybe people would say, you know, we got to get out of here. But then again, you think you've got the old, you've got children that can't move that fast. Rather than suffer what they thought was coming, they decided to end it. So that, to me, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I I really don't. I can't comprehend something like that. And that is a scary thought, that something like that can happen. Well, as you said, it is more of a sad story than a horror story. But um, it's something to think about. Um, That was a downer. Um, <laughs> sorry, but we had to get the, that one out of the way because that yeah, was I there. Know. I know. the 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 other story, the, the next story that that I want to talk about, um, which I'm surprised you haven't brought up, Lucy, is um, the 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 story about Rita Swift in California. Oh, okay. And um, I thought this was interesting. Again, it's similar to to other stories that you have heard about, mainly uh, in regards to alien life, uh, about, you know, photos that have been just discovered that sort of claim Mm -hmm. to show photos of aliens, um, you know, either corpse dead aliens or live aliens, whatever it may be. Um, This story is similar but different in a way, and it's got a a ghostly uh, attachment to it. And so... There's there's a woman who by the name of Rita Swift, and again you can you can Google that name uh, online. And in uh, July of 1997, she was uh, sifting through her attic in her home in uh, Orange County, California, and uh, she came across film that had been undeveloped for 28 years that she had in her home. And uh, she was surprised to learn that she had film, you know, there were pictures there, obviously, of family um, from years past, but there was a a reel of film that was never developed at all. And she was excited. I mean, I would be super excited if I ever found anything like that. I'd be like, what the hell is on this thing? Uh, and I'd, I'd run to wherever I could to get this thing developed. Now, um, she obviously had to go somewhere special to get this film developed because um, it was from the 60s. Um, and so she got the film developed, and I believe there were maybe it was 19, 19 of 20 pictures. 19, 19 um, well, there were only a few pictures, but there were 19 photos total taken on that reel. And uh, as she was going through the photos, she got up to what she's calling photo 16, which um, was, I believe, of her daughter, I think. Uh, her five-year-old daughter, her yes. cat, her swing set, and other backyard pictures. And there was photo 16 had a photo of her daughter standing by the doorway, uh, by the sliding glass door, as I guess leading to the backyard. And this photo 16 was a little strange because um, she claims that there's this 
uh, not orb, but sort of this white, hazy ectoplasm next to her daughter. And uh, she's not claiming that to be paranormal at all because she's not sure what that is. It could be the flash from the, the, the uh, sliding glass doors when, uh, when she took the photo. So she's not putting that up as evidence of anything. Photo 17 is where it gets strange. Now, I'm not sure fully because the, air, the, the research that I found, I, I didn't see a reason as to why she was taking these pictures if she remembered, but it was photos of her backyard or, or photos mm-hmm. taken of something that she was taking in the backyard. And in this photo, in the back of this photo, the far end of this photo, there seems to be what appears to be shamans preparing for a ritual, Native American shamans preparing a, a death ritual, a cremation. And the photos are outstanding to me. Um, they've, they've got this... Um, uh, this I, I, I don't know if she said she had a fisheye lens on this camera or that was the way that it, it was developed that way and created this way. Um, so you'll see these, these photos online where it, you can clearly see what appears to be Native Americans, um, a group of them. This is not one or two. This is a group of Native Americans uh, performing, it looks like, to be a cremation ritual. Uh, from, I believe, the early 1700s. I think that's where this is being dated from. And um, the the photo 17, and I'll read it as this. Uh, in photo 17, they appear to be shamans preparing for ritual. The third Native American is strangely in total shadow or silhouette, but there are bright feathers behind his head and in front of the second dancer. There is an extremely bright area, perhaps a pool of water in the distant background, the circle of the lens is very profound, and that's the, the fisheye lens that I was talking about. Uh, and natural light and shadow seemed not of this world. The first Indian appears to be in a crouched position, wearing a dried half of a gourd on his on his head, which, um, after it being um, analyzed, is true to form for the uh, ceremonies for Native Americans of that time and in that area. Now, photo 18 um, is of what she's claiming to be of a greater mystery. And I'll read this. There appears to be a ritual with an oxen at the lower level in the foreground. Possibly there is a body tied to the back of the oxen. In the center, there are two shamans on their knees. The one in the rear can be seen, but it's transparent, transparent both holding a long pole with a paddle on the end, touching the back of the oxen. To the right, there is an individual with a flute wearing a feathered skirt. There is a transparent figure right behind the flute player, possibly holding a pole. This is where the mystery becomes stranger. There appears to be a Victorian woman, blonde hair, wearing a fur-collared opera coat just to the right of the flute player. The flute player's head tilted up, looking to the background. She seems to be sitting between more poles pointed in the direction of the oxen. The background seems distorted with large areas of ectoplasm. To the left of the side of the Native American in the center, there is another feathered ghostly individual. To the right side of the individual behind the oxen, there is a female on her knees facing the oxen. She is transparent, but her long black hair is touching the ground. She is reaching for a pole structured behind and above her. Some have told me that this appears to be the evil face in the foreground, over the oxen's back. The lens circle is still visible, but for some reason fading. Uh, Shadow and light are unnatural, exhibiting an eerie scene. So it's not just, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen this online and on social media, where people will post pictures of a possible entity, ghost or spirit form, um, either, you know, within a window, within a door frame, within a window frame, um, out in the open, And it is singular. It is one entity. Either it's the face, the whole body, whatever your apparition may be. This is a group of people. This is a group of Native Americans and a Victorian woman of a completely different era, all in this one photo. Um, There's also photo 19, which has and depicts the similar scene, but at a different time, 
uh, let's just say a different time of that day during that ceremony, where again, you've got all of these shamans together, what seems to be a ritual near a body of pool of water, which was never in existence at this woman's house in her backyard. Uh, and so she had this analyzed. She, um, I'm trying to see where she actually um, she brought it to. She contacted Southwest Museum in Los Angeles. That's it. Southwest Museum in Los Angeles. And um, they analyzed and researched this photo and found the contents on this photo to not have been manipulated or placed onto this film. Um, they also then did some history back on it and um, uh, named the Native Americans the Shumash, which um, occupied the land, the land that she had her home, that she lives on, that is at her house, and went through the ceremonial um, uh, history notes on uh, what they would do for cremation or what they would do with their dead. And as this woman is reading the history, it is exact to the T of what this photo represents. Um, so it, that is alone amazes me, because you don't find that anywhere right now. But she then talks about the story of when she first moved into this home in 1960... 1962 when she moved into this home in 1962 she was a newlywed she had just gotten married and they found bones uh, on her land as they were um, digging up the land and trying to renovate the home they found bones and again she brought these to I don't know if it was a museum or somewhere to get it analyzed uh, I'm sorry here we go they were taken to California State College at Long Beach and they were found to be the remains of a Mongol-type female approximately 7,000 years old. This story, as I read this, gave me chills. Well, did you go a little bit further? The area, the spot where they found the bones, okay? They built over it. They built a living room over it. There's a oh, small right. piano, that the baby grand piano, sits in that spot where they found the bones. Her daughter would practice. And she would say, do I have to keep practicing because I can hear flutes? I hear those flutes again. And this is what was happening when uh, the daughter was practicing. They would smell a sweet burning wood that follows them from room to room and then disappears. They hear children giggling where there are no children. And they see life-size shadow people that appear behind them only to dart away at great speed. There is something happening there. And the thing is that really got me about this one, when you look at these photos, okay, if you've gone to the museum or even if you've, you've you know, looked them up online, there is a look that old photos have. And you talked about it, how people, you know, they use the ghost app now and you pretty much can you pretty much can tell when something's added. The whole rest of the, the picture is normal. And you have this one entity, whatever it is in there. These photos aren't like that. These are full photos of a scene, of something happening. And they appear to be Native Americans. The scary part about this, to me, is you have this Victorian woman in there. Mm -hmm. You know, what is she doing there? But when I'm looking at these pictures, and I really wished I tried to find larger, you know, enlargements of the pictures, and you really can't. They're all small, so I had to try to, to enlarge them on my computer, and then they start getting real grainy. But when you look at these pictures, they are definitely, they're not from, whatever's happening is not happening in present day. There is something definitely there. Now, what I did, I went a little bit more into the, the Shumash uh, history and pretty much what happened to the Shumash. The Spanish came up to California, okay, and they started building missions and they started taking the land and whatever. Um, they promised the Shumash that they would return the land to them. Well, that never happened. Um the Mexican authorities never returned the land to them. Um, Santa Barbara, this whole area became, they started 
building it up and everything like that. And the Shumash never got their land back. So this one, is it possible that the land is haunted by the Shumash? Who This is their land. Okay, this is where, and if you're talking about a cremation ceremony, obviously this area was sacred land to them because they had their dead there. Again, here we have, you know, the area where dead people are. It's sacred land. You're not supposed to touch it, you know, defile it or anything like that. But you've got people building a whole city, a whole town over this. I believe it is haunted. I believe that this is something. The only thing in this one I cannot explain is the Victorian woman. That's the only thing. Everything else to me falls into place with haunting. It falls into place with, yeah, the ancestors of the Shumash are still there. They're not leaving their sacred land. Well, this this Victorian woman may have lived on that land, and because of the energies, and I agree with Liz29 in chat, um, as she's talking about residual energies, uh, I definitely think that this is a case of residual energy uh, of mass proportion. Um, but because of that huge energy that surrounds this land, um, anything could be attracted to it. And so you could have this Victorian woman coming back. You know, she may have mm-hmm. not led a great life and felt the warmth of the land, um, uh, you know, of that energy and has returned. And therefore, you've got a mix of old and, and newer um, spirits who are coming together. There's many, many haunted locations out there that, you know, you, you don't just get the residuals or you don't get the the uh, uh, apparitions of one era. Uh, they, they, there's usually the mix, mm-hmm. and, and it's be- because they're attracted to it. Um, Rita goes on also to say that she wants to, um, she actually found a place in New York to, to get the the exact film that was used for that camera, um, which I believe she has, and she was going to try and see if she can take photos with that same exact camera again in her backyard. I'm going to pose this to you, Lucy. Get a paper and pen. Let's see if she'll come on our show and talk about this. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would be really interested to talk with her and talk to her, not only just about the story of the photos and such, that fascinates me, but I'm sure she's got a ton of stories that uh, of paranormal in nature that have gone on that uh, I would be curious to find out um, what some of those are and maybe could answer some of the questions or maybe help her answer some of the questions uh, that she she may have. I would love to talk to her. Well, there are Shumash that live on the Santa Inez Reservation. It would be interesting to talk to them, too, to mm-hmm. get their side of it. Yeah, So definitely. And it could be worth a trip going good. out to the West Coast. Ooh. <laughs> Who knows? Who Honestly, knows? you know, see, my first instinct on this one was like, something needs to happen. Something needs, there needs to be kind of like, kind of like what I did with Bobby Mackey's in the basement with the tobacco. There needs to be some kind of, not so much cleansing, but there needs to be an acknowledgement of these spirits. They have there. There has to be. Yeah, well, because you've that's got, what I'm saying. May, maybe talking to Rita. Maybe she's done that already. Maybe she's called upon I, I it already. I would hope so. You know. I would hope so. But yeah, no, that's definitely interesting. I really would like to talk to both sides. All right, I'm going to read this story because I just thought it was funny. Um, I've heard of this before, um, and I'm sure you guys out there who are listening and watching uh, probably have heard this idea theory um how many of you out there know the the children's song ring around the rosy <laughs> show of hands who's who's heard of it We're ring around the rosy <laughs> we've we've all heard this ring around the rosy um sing it but have you i'm not singing it nobody wants to hear me sing um but how many of you out there understand that there possibly could be a connection to this rhyme to the plague, to the Black Death. How many out there? Did you know that, Lucy? Did you know about this story? 
before reading? I it? had heard this before. I had heard this before. That do you did you believe? Did you do you believe or did you believe that there was a connection to the Ring Around the Rosie to the 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 Black Death? I actually did believe it until I did a little bit more research. Okay. Well, apparently, you know, Ring Around the Rosie, if everybody knows, um, uh, appeared in Mother Goose Rhymes in 1881. Um, But people have said that the Ring Around the Rosie was actually based upon the the London Plague of 1665, the Black Death. And uh, the origin of, of this poem actually comes from from that era and was written um, in a way to, some say mock the Black Death, some say um, cope with the Black Death. Um, I'm not sure, but this is, this is what has been, has been talked about and written. When you, when you sing the, the, this song, the rhyme, Ring Around the Rosie, um, it's actually a grim remembrance of some sort of cataclysmic event uh, that uh, is, I guess, defeats the the, the purpose of a, of a nursery rhyme. But um, the Black Death struck Europe with a fury in uh, 1347, and this disease is, it wasn't just one area. If you guys all know about this, it, it migrated from Asia. Um, you know, obviously the trade routes were heavy during this time, 1300s and 1400s, and uh, it, it decimated Asia, Africa, and Europe unlike anything ever before. Um, the disease depopulated the world by at least 20% and killed between 30 to 60% of Europe's population. That's why they call it the Black Death. But the first line of Ring Around the Rosie um, describes the... The, the rings that were formed around um, the, the center red mark that people had acquired during the, 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 the plague, the Black Death, um, it was a swelling of, of the lymph node, and this swelling is often circular, making this ring. Uh, the, center, the center turns black and is surrounded by a red rash. The rosy is the center of this red, reddish ring. Um, pocket full of posies. Posies were used in that time for um, what they called air fresheners. It, it was utilized and put upon the death, the dead, to uh, mask that that horrid smell that came up came about from a decaying body. And uh, posies were used a lot. And because of the the the, the Black Death. There were many, many people daily dead on the streets, and so they would line the streets and line the windows of the homes with posies to give off that fragrant smell uh, to mask all of that death smell that, that came about. Um, the the third stanza um, talks about well, there's a translation difference that I believe may have happened, or, or these people believe may have happened. Um, originally, it was achu. Achu, which signified the sneezing, which happened during the Black Black Plague, you you began to get sort of cold-like symptoms. Um, but when this was translated into um, the American um, version, uh, that was altered to ashes, ashes, as some people say. But if you look at it this way, ashes, ashes talks about the death, talks about um, you know your bones turning into ash, uh, which happened at cremation, and so. Um, that was sort of the, the the translation idea. Now, the ending, we all fall down. Um, you can put two and two together and basically say that that means that uh, people died. You, you're, you're dead. You, you fell to the floor and, and died. Um, there's there's some people that don't believe this, and, and Lucy will probably explain uh, her side of it. I don't know if there is a link between the two, um, you know, there's a lot of stories out there right now about Disney and the uh-huh. the possibilities of where Disney got their ideas for their characters and their storylines that are truly morbid. That's a show on its own. Um, and so I, I was thinking about that and thinking, could 
this be the same correlation to it? Um, but I don't know. W- what do you think, Lucy? Well, the first thing that I thought about was Monty Python and the, mm. the <laughs> bring out your dad, <laughs> bring out your dad. But I went to Snopes for this one, okay? And they have an explanation from a folklorist named Philip Hiscock. And what he suggests is the more likely explanation is to be found in the religious ban on dancing among many Protest, uh, Protestants in the 19th century in Britain as well as here in North America. Adolescents found a way around the dancing ban with what they called the play party. Play parties consisted of ring games, which differed from square dances only in their name and their lack of musical accompaniment. Um, they were very popular. Uh, they involved rings of children. There's other, like if you remember Little Sally Saucer mm-hmm. is one of them. Um, ring Around the Rosie seems to be another. The rings referred to in the rhyme are liter- literally the rings formed by the playing children. Ashes, ashes probably comes from something like husha, husha, another common variant, which refers to the stopping, uh, refers to stopping the ring and falling silent. The falling down refers to the jumble of bodies in the ring when they let go of each other and throw themselves into the circle. I kind of believe that rather than the other, but the other one sounds better. (laughs) <laughs> well, you know the black flag <laughs> but I, I kind of believe that it might be and there was another article that I read and I didn't uh, print it up but it was the timeline the timeline it's highly unlikely you know the song really didn't appear until about the 19th century when all of this the black death is you know 13th 14th century Right. so right. the timeline didn't didn't match you know, right? Could it be people that you know? It's their tribute to the Black Death. I, 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 I don't think so. You know, I, it's something to think about. And like I said, you know, there's a lot of stories out there about Disney, and uh, you know, they went far back to uh, to create characters using using morbid history uh, as mm-hmm. the base for it. So, so who knows? It, you know, it could be, it could not be. But I've heard this many, many years ago. Um, and, you know, I sort of laughed it off. It was something funny to talk about. It was something that you can bring up in a conversation um, and, and uh, you know, you know, spark a debate with people. Um, and it worked a lot of times because people would fight over whether or not it was true or not. But it, it's, it's a story nonetheless. And, uh, you know, you guys out there who are listening, you be the judge. What do you believe in? Um, what do you want to get to next? I got a really interesting. Uh, well, you know, I love the island of the dolls. I want to go there someday. The Isla de las Muñecas, the island of the dolls in Mexico. This is a small uh, island that is around the water air, watery air, area around Mexico City, Tenochtitlan. And there is a story that there was this old man named Julian Santana Barrera. And he retreated to a remote wooded area in, I can't say this, <laughs> around Mexico City to live out his life as a recluse. While he was out there living, he discovered the body of a young girl and that she had drowned in the waterway. And she left a toy doll behind. It was floating in the canal when he arrived. Mr. Barrera began to hear footsteps at night, and he could hear the wails of a woman after he hung the stall from a tree. So in order to appease, to make the woman stop crying, he would hang more dolls up in the trees. And eventually he kept hanging dolls more and more to the point where it looked like the trees had all these dolls. Well, the story has it is that when you go to this island, you can hear the dolls whisper. You can hear the little girl. You can hear, um, this has been for 50 years. Now, um, Don Don Barrera has has passed on. His family still continues to run the area. And visitors come to the island and they, um, if you remember Destination Truth, 
did a, sto- uh, a story there, which was really freaky because one of the dolls that they were filming, you actually see the eyes open, hmm. which freaked me out. Um, it is very, very, in Mexico, it is thought to be haunted. It is extremely haunted. And the the thing is, is that when you hear this little girl, she's trying to get you to come into the water. So it has an evil overtone to it. Whether or now, whether or not it's true, I won't know until I set foot on this place. But it fascinates me to no end. I mean, I really, really think this place is haunted. What's also eerie is that um, it's supposedly that um, uh, Don Juan, as as he's named in America. Um, died in the same spot that he supposedly the girl died in as well, um, mm-hmm. and so it's, I'm not sure if that's coincidence or not. And they say that he's now gone on to to meet the girl, and he himself actually um, makes his his presence known on the island as well. Um, the other part of this is that this whole story is made up. That uh, this man Don Juan has just basically gone insane. And uh, moved to, to to this island, made up the story because this is just what was in his head, and uh, decided to just um, uh, believe it to be reality. His 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 insane mind believe it to be reality, and uh, continued with the storyline that uh, there was this dead girl, and continued to uh, appease the spirit of the dead girl by hanging dolls all over the island continuously all the time um it's kind of strange where did he get all these dolls from and did he make these treks back to the mainland just for these dolls and food and such and so yeah you have to think you know was he he wasn't forced to live on this island he wasn't commanded to live on this island he could have moved and gone anywhere else he wanted to go um but he stayed here and so it kind of makes makes you wonder a little bit well, you have many people who swear up and down that this island is haunted, and they can hear those dolls whispering. So. True. True. Um, and I'm sure everybody's heard of that, that story. Um, if you are, you know, knee-deep in the paranormal, uh, that story has come across your lap at least once before. Um, so, And you can research it and then look through it. It's a really interesting story, and um, we've talked about it a couple times on our show before. So uh, research it if you want on your own. It's, it's If you want a creeped-out evening, this will certainly uh, uh, make you wet your pants. But <laughs> one of the things that I put on this list, Lucy, was called White Enamel, and it was the interactive movie game. Oh. Mm-hmm. Did did you get a chance to actually play this game? I tried. It wouldn't work for me. It kept stopping and it kept stopping. So oh. what? I, I I couldn't get through it. But it was what I got out of it was creepy enough, and especially from our own experiences in some of the asylums that we've been to, and then just going back in and reading. It really reminded me of Penhurst and what mm-hmm. we experienced there and it just just to take it from the cuz the this this game or how whatever you want to call it there it, it puts you in the place of like you walking into this asylum you walking through the hallways and you seeing the whole campus and that this has got to be really, really creepy, and I wish I could have made it work because I would have liked to have taken it all the way through. You were able to get through it, right? Um, there is, uh, I think there's what they call um, pages, and, and that's the the levels, I think it is what it's called. And uh, mm-hmm. th- th- let me back up a little bit. Um, I did some research, and while I was doing research for tonight's show, uh, you know, we were we were looking up all these horrible and horror, scary stories and such, and um, continually as I was doing this, a lot of sites um, were alluding to the, 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 the deep web. And I'm sure you guys have heard about the deep web. And it's sort of like the, the underground, the hell of, mm-hmm. of the Internet, of the World Wide Web. And it's, 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 it's a place where it's not easily accessible 
um, a lot of times you 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 have to go through uh, you know sort of I'm not a techie person, but you have to go through a lot of means to get you down into there. You have to follow there. the links to get to the – in order to get to the site that you're really looking for, there's a lot of links that you have to go. There's different paths that you have to take. And sometimes the path that you have typed in isn't always the one. There might be one off in there that you need to get to. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like um, uh, a treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. That's basically what it is. And then when you finally get to the end, you get these websites. And these are not the websites. If you Google in something, they're not going to pop up. You kind of right. have to have the knowledge already to know what you're looking for. You, you have to dig deep to, to find these places. And a lot of them you, you have to um, reveal yourself, reveal your, um, uh, what is it called, the IP address, or or it mm -hmm. reveals your IP address to them. So uh, it, it it's, it's almost like... Um, Think of the movie Eyes Wide Shut with Tom Cruise. It's sort of that. You know, if you were to find that deep down, maybe ten stories below ground, um, that's what the deep web is basically about. But anyway, the the site is called whiteenamel.com. And if you go to that, it is an it, it's not it's not a regular game as as Lucy was just talking about. It's more of an interactive movie game. And I'm going to say this. I would suggest if you are a paranormal investigator out there and you are going to be going to, you know, an insane, a haunted insane asylum, whether it be Penhurst or Rolling Hills or wherever in the country or in the world, um, I would suggest going to this site and playing this interactive game, movie game. I say movie game because it's not just a game. Um, it is... It puts you in, as Lucy was just talking about, it puts you in the asylum. It actually creates the the idea that you are a patient at this hospital, but it does it in a way that it reveals the story. It, it unfolds the story of how patients were treated at insane asylums back in the day. And I got to page two. I got to the second level, and then... Um, I didn't get a chance to go back and continue playing um, or, or finish the game. But when I was doing research, uh, a lot of people were talking about that they didn't even get past page one. Um, and it's kind of weird because it's not a regular type of game. Um, mm -hmm. You don't click on arrows. You don't uh, move your mouse and you move forward or anything like that. You actually have to move the mouse over the entire image that or, or the entire screen of, of your laptop, computer, whatever, and find the piece that will move you forward into this in this movie game. Um, all the while, there is audio going on, uh, a distant patient moaning, um, screaming, uh, glass breaking, and then it will Footsteps. stop at some point. Footsteps. And then it will stop at some point while you're interacting and being interactive in this movie game. It will stop and reveal video to you, uh, real video of some of the hard conditions that patients uh, endured during their time and their stay, and uh, reveal stories of some patients, actual audio recordings of psychiatrists uh, revealing information about a patient. Um, it's... It's 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 sort of morbid. It is sort of horrorish, um, but it actually tugged at my heartstrings a little bit, and that's why I suggest people who are paranormal investigators or are thinking about going to an insane asylum to do an investigation play this game first. You'll get a better understanding of the patients than you you wouldn't normally get from a documentary or from just reading something online because you are being put into that situation and trying to figure out what the hell is going on and what do I do next. And what's also good is that the, the, the um, controller, for lack of a better word, where you have to move your mouse over the entire screen to find that one, you know, if it's a, a piece of brick and that's the piece of brick that, that you tap on, 
to to move forward or, or a window, whatever it is, um, that frustration that you feel of moving that mouse over drives you insane. It it makes you go crazy that you know you, you you'll sit there. When I was trying to leave page one to get to page two, I sat there for ten minutes trying to figure out <laughs> what, what am I doing? I moved my mouse over every single inch of that the screen and came to the conclusion. I said I, I have no idea w- what else to do. There's nothing else that I can click on because I clicked on everything and nothing is moving me forward. And I pressed enter. And enter moved me to to uh, to page two. There's there's nothing that gives you an instruction. There's nothing that gives you instructions on this. But it, it's it's really deep. And and uh, the images in there, um, are, you know, at, at one point you you get freaked out and scared, and then at another point you you actually are feeling sorry and you feel sad uh, and sorrow. So it's. Um, it's it's a fluctuation of your emotions, which I'm sure mm-hmm. is what is going on in the patients in an insane asylum. And so it's really interesting. Um, and I wanted to include that in tonight's show because I thought, uh, I think something can get, everybody can get something from this game, this movie game, interactive movie game, that uh, may be special to you um, and can be a little bit different than what I would have experienced or what Lucy would have experienced. So check it out. And, and um, if you've got time, go to white enamel, like like paint enamel, whiteenamel.com. And you don't have to download anything. It just starts up right away once you, once you go there. So check it out. You know what? I actually did get farther than you then. I actually made it to the third page. And Oh, you did? Um, I, yeah, I did. And I kind of cheated and went to like page six or something like that and it was really weird because it's got the outside all of a sudden you're outside and there's a bench there and unless you really you know it'll take the 10 minutes to find it there's a movie camera on that bench and when you click on the movie camera then all of a sudden you get a film and that film unfortunately it's sad because it does show like shock treatments and stuff like that so it, it is it is really something. You really have to do it because until you walk into one of these places, you're you're walking in and you can feel what's been what's there. But you've got the vision of what you're seeing in real time. You're seeing the you know the the deterioration and all that. This little film kind of gives you a little bit different perspective. It kind of puts you back into the time when it was really open and when it was really working and the only thing I can think of oh god where were we um, the place that had the intake room at, in the basement that was um, in West Virginia um, oh god oh god oh the intake there room there was a room yeah I remember downstairs in the basement there was a door to the back and there was a little room down there, what they called the intake room, where they would bring the residents or the inmates to the asylum. And this is the first place where they undressed them and got their information. And all I can remember was the energy in that room and the fear that was there. And this kind of is almost the same thing without actually being in that room. And I can't remember. Where did we... Oh, well, you know, it's funny because while I was um, trying to, uh, while I was playing this this interactive no. movie game, what? Somebody said Waverly Hills. It's not Waverly Hills. We don't oh, go to Waverly no. Hills. Um, when um, when I was when I was playing this game, um, it brought me back to when we were in um, Penhurst, and when we were. Uh, 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 in the area where I, it, it actually I over, was overcame with uh, feeling of sadness and sorrow, and uh, mm-hmm. you know I, I don't know if it's called or oppressed or uh, if if some entity you know took over my mind or my body or whatever it was. There's there's a video that we have of me walking through, and it, it's almost as if I'm like a zombie, 
um, uh, walking through this, and I don't remember anything happening during that period of time. But there's a video of me sort of um, uh, standing still and then swaying back and forth and not of sound mind and uh, very odd, weird. And I, I remember that feeling during that, that time, mostly towards the beginning and then towards the end as I was coming out of it, that feeling of sorrow. And while I was doing this game, that same feeling came over me again. And so um, I, I, I recommend this this uh, this game for, for people to watch. I mean, even if you're not an investigator or anything like that, it, it, and you're, you're interested in understanding um, what other people had gone through uh, at an insane asylum, uh, it, it's it it just from the little bit that I played, it, it it really got me. It was an experience. I mean, I definitely want to go through it. But yeah, I did make it to the third page, and it's kind of weird. I mean, the only reason why I figured out the enter was because I'm a gamer. I mean, you know, right? That's one of those things. But um, oh, one thing I wanted to that that I was thinking about when you were talking about like the 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 inner web, the dark web. Um, mm-hmm. That's where, if you get a VPN, that's where that helps a lot. Because when you're revealing, if you've got a, v, a virtual private network, if you can set up a VPN, it's a little bit easier to access some of these these things. Yeah, but also, too, a lot of these places, in, and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, when we talk about the, the deep web, um, it, it is not an innocent place. This is where... Um, no. No. Um, and so I don't suggest that people doing research and trying to find other websites on the deep web don't do it. I don't suggest doing it at all. The best hackers in the world have said, do not go there, because a lot of them will grab the in- your information. A lot of these people that have built these sites in, in the deep web know how to get the information from you. Um, a lot of them talk about... Um, having to pay for sites, and when you when you have pay sites, and what they use is Bitcoin. They don't use, you know, they don't take money out of your credit card or anything like that. They don't use any of that. Uh, you utilize Bitcoin, which is possibly a little bit more secure. But um, if people are talking about a paid site in the deep web, run the other way as fast as you can, because mm-hmm. most of the time, those are torture websites. Real life live action torture websites, rape sites, they video rapes live, and people who pay to get on these websites will pay for the people who are on the other end of the uh, the other end of that camera or that video to do things to people, and they will pay to have that happen. Um, it, it's so disgusting and. Um, there's no words actually to describe what goes on in the deep web. Um, you can read about and learn about what the deep web is all about, um, but I do not suggest anybody going out there and searching a site and logging in and trying to give them any of the information. Even just by clicking on these sites on the deep web, they can gather your stuff. So I, don't even bother going there. Think of the movie Hostel. Um, when they were killing all these tourists and stuff, that's what they were doing it for because people would pay to see someone be tortured. This is right. the kind of thing that you see. So, um, it's sick and twisted. It's sick and twisted, a lot of these stories. And you can actually go to YouTube where some people, some hackers actually have um, videos where they've hacked into these hacker sites uh, that were created and did it safely enough so that they can report back and say what's been going on and what people have out there and what they're doing. Um, but but from these hackers, they're saying you, the layperson, you know, the normal people out there, don't ever go to these sites on your own at all, at all. Well, the main thing is to protect your own IP address. You don't want that out there because with your IP address, anyone can find out where you're at. Right. And remember when I mentioned uh, uh, the movie Eyes Wide Shut and I was comparing that to before? Uh, Picture Eyes Wide Shut, but a thousand times creepier. That's what the deep web Mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, what's what's next on your list? We have, wow, we got 20 minutes left in the show. Holy crap. And we've only gone through half. This one made me sad. 
It's the dog suicide bridge of Dunbartonshire. Oh. <laughs> this is a bridge that is located near the village of Milton in the burr of Dumbarton, Scotland. And there is a bridge, and for some reason or another, it has been attracting suicidal dogs since the early 60s. At least 50 dogs have thrown themselves from this bridge. They don't know why. They don't know what does this, but the dogs have been, they've actually seen dogs trying to climb up to the bridge so that they can jump. The dogs that have survived, there have been a couple dogs that survived, they actually try to get back up on the bridge to jump. Um, the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals has sent representatives to investigate it, but even they can't figure out what's going on. Um, now, it, basically, I mean, can dogs be suicidal? I don't know, okay? But... The, the the theory is is that there is something around or near this bridge that is making these dogs want to jump off of it. <coughs> Excuse me. And the and the the most logical explanation that they could come up with is the smell of mink. Um, most of these suicides have happened like during the summer when it's dry, when it's hot, and what the scientists have thought that. They occur that when a mink, the little mink, is marking the area with a very strong scent, that scent combined with the bridge wall, because when the dogs are there, the way the bridge wall is, they can't see over the bridge. They, all, they, they can't see anything, so they can't see the water. So when they can't see and they really have no sense of where they are, that makes the scent more, very strong, really strong strong enough that the dogs want to jump over and grab the mink. And the experiments that they did, they used the scent and in a different area. And 90% of the time, the dogs would run towards the scent of mink other than anything else. So this is a theory that they have. But there is also a theory that there is a supernatural reason. Um... The, in, uh, the, in, they call it the thin place, okay? In Celtic mythology, Overton is known as the thin place. It is an area where heaven and earth are reported to be close. And because they think that dogs are more sensitive to, uh, than humans, um, animals are hypersensitive to the spirit world. And maybe they're feeling this energy, you know, um, what is it? There is also another story that nearby in one of the towns that a baby was thrown from the bridge and thrown into the river. And they think that this is possibly the spirit of the child or something like that that is coming back and possibly possessing the dogs and causing them to jump over the bridge. So no one has an answer to this, um, but these poor dogs are jumping. And that does not, I mean, that's sad. That's really sad. So I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't think a dog can be suicidal. I've had dogs all my life. I don't think a dog can be suicidal. <laughs> I mean, you, you I think, really don't. You think your dog would have killed himself because he lived with you? <laughs> I mean, come on. All they did was eat, sleep, and play. I mean, you know, it's not like I was asking them to pay rent. You know, you know I, I, think, I think you may be right, and I, I kind of believe the story about the mink and the scent and it wanting to um, find the mink because of the scent smell that mm -hmm. they, uh, it's permeating over, over the, the stone wall of this bridge. Um, but I believe that there has been, you know, horses that have, quote, committed suicide over this bridge or other animals as well. Um, and I don't know if it has any relation to it or not, um, and I don't know how true that portion of the story is or not, um, but I tend to believe more of that scientific part of it, that, that there's got to be that reason why those dogs are, are jumping up. And we're talking about 50 dogs, I believe, a year, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's a lot. That, that's, that, that's a high uh, percentage. Um, 
So there's got to be a logical reason for it. Um, you know, you don't. If there is such an energy like that, why wouldn't people be jumping off the bridge? You know. I don't know, but the only thing I can say is that you know what tonight, hug your puppies, okay? They need they 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 need that love, okay? Just hug your puppies. <laughs> This next story I wanted to share with everybody because I've never heard of this. How many people out there have heard of liquid cremation? Did you? No, I've never heard of it. But I have never. One that, thing. I, oh, can I say something? This story tied into the very first story you had on your list. To me, it had a correlation. Yes. Yes, um, which we haven't talked about yet, but um, liquid cremation or um, what's scientifically known as alkaline hydrolysis um, is what it means. It is actually liquefying uh, by means of boiling, I believe, uh, the the flesh, the, the, the dead body. And it is supposed to be the, the quote-unquote greener way of um of um what's the word I'm trying disposing. to think of disposing re- of of a dead body than than cremation than regular burning cremation or uh of just you know body in a, in a in a casket uh type of funeral um liquid cremation or, or this alkaline hydrolysis is supposed to be the greener way better for the environment I don't know um, and also um, cheaper uh, as well. And what it's doing is basically liquefying the, the, the soft tissues and the soft organs uh, of your body off of your body, off of your bones, sorry, and draining it. It goes into the ground. And then what they do is, is um, uh uh, burn uh, burn the, the bones and crush it to ashes and give that to you in an urn uh, just as if you were to do a regular cremation. Um, I have never heard of this at all. Uh, I never even thought that this could be even a possibility to do. Um, people have said that, you know, that's disgusting about, you know, draining your loved one down, you know, it's sort of like boiling them and then just draining them down the drain, you know, sort of like in the toilet. Um, but, People who are doing this, this method, are saying, well, when you embalm a body, you know, the, the blood from from your loved one that has died that's on that table, their blood is being drained down as well, and it's going down, you know, the tubes uh, into the sewers. Uh, so it, it's sort of the same thing, but this is kind of weird. But um, here's a list of the states that this is legal in. Colorado, Florida, Illinois... So, Lucy, watch out. (laughs) Kansas, Maine, Maryland, Minnesota, and Oregon. Um, uh, It was done in Ohio, I think. They tried to do it, but I think they stopped it because people were just disgusted. Uh, It didn't seem as, uh, you know, as ethically correct to do. But I, but what this story did for me was just stir up a conversation in my head. Is this right? Is it is it ethical? Is it something that you could conceive doing to your loved one, or or of someone that you loved so much to do this to? I don't know it's legal in Illinois. Well, you think your son is going to do that to you? Oh yeah, probably. But no, I mean, okay. Here's here's what I read. Okay, the process. Okay. In alkaline hydrolysis, the body is enclosed in a silk bag, which in most cases is going to be uh, the casket liner. Then this silk shrouded body is placed inside a metal cage and loaded into a machine called a resometer. It is then filled with a mixture of water and potassium hydroxide and set to 180 degrees Celsius, 356 degrees Fahrenheit. You are putting your loved one in a food processor. That's basically bo- what that said to me. Yeah, you're boiling them. <laughs> I mean, you're putting them in a... Well, they crush the bones. They crush the bones to a fine ash. But you're putting your loved one in a food processor. How is this respectful? 
that's the big that's the big what but, I read look, that was the big but look at it this way regular cremation which has been around for a long time is mm-hmm. is can be equated to you're putting your loved one in the fireplace if you're right. putting it in simplest terms you're putting I'm I'm not defending this liquid cremation at all cuz I think it's kind of morbid and weird I would never do that to anybody and I hope nobody does that to me um but but you can equate it to cremation as somebody being thrown into the fireplace it it's it's almost the same thing or or in an oven you know it, it's almost the same thing I just think I mean and if they do say that it's cheaper I don't get it I mean why go through this if you want to if you want you know like Put somebody back, you know, into the earth. If you want to spread their ashes somewhere, you have them cremated, and then you just spread the ashes, okay? But it's it's uh, what they're saying. But but they're saying that this is um, much uh, a much more eco friendly way to dispose of the body because it's using less energy um, and less time. I, if we're getting to the age where we're thinking about going eco friendly with the way that we die and dispose of bodies. It goes against hundreds and thousands of years of ceremonial rituals that we have instilled in in, in all of culture to respect the dead um, to the point now where ju- we're just boiling them. That, that's barbaric, um, and that's almost savage. And as you said, that actually takes us to one of the other stories that is actually true that's mm-hmm. still happening today. Um, that maybe we can try and get to. We've got about eight minutes. Let me just run through this, and then you can comment as well on this. Um, oh, my so God. It brings, us, it brings us back to this this original story that I had first time. This was the first thing that I found. And have, how many of you actually heard of the Yanomamo, uh, or tree people, foot tribe? Um, where are they? They're in the Amazon. Venezuela. Ven, uh, they're in uh, the Amazon. Uh, the Amazon forest uh, between uh, Venezuela and Brazil. How many of you guys have heard of the Yanomamo, or tree people, tribe? These folks, if, if you thought that that was disgusting, what we just talked about, these okay. tribes, this, these group of men, first of all, they treat, um, they treat their own people and their own women um, like crap. They rape them, they beat them, they brand them. Uh, they're still living, mind you. They're still in this, this area. Uh, of the uh, the tropical forests of the Amazon, they're still there. Um, but what they do with the dead is they consume their dead. It's not cannibalism. What they do is the same thing as sort of liquefying. They create a beverage out of your, again, soft tissue and drink you. You know, cannibalism is eating you. They drink you. They they crush the bones and and they do ceremonies with that and all, but they drink you, um, and I thought this was disgusting. They're still alive. They're still doing this to this day. And just to note, um, there's there's a bunch of uh, gold miners right now that are um, have been for a while now uh, going to this territory and spreading diseases to try and kill off this tribe. Now I don't know if that's right. Uh, you know, they're not hurting anyone other than themselves, this tribe. So I don't know if that is the correct way to do this, but they're trying to get rid of this tribe out of the Amazon rainforest. And uh, they're they're going by the, the whole method of we're doing this for the good of the world and getting rid of these barbaric people. But um, I can guarantee you 99.9999% they're just doing this to find gold in the area. That's my opinion. Well, that's exactly what it is. But the whole thing is, is that the reason why these people drink um, the the dead dead one is so that they can retain the physical and spiritual strength of the person that's passed on. This right. is such a Jeffrey Dahmer moment. I mean, but so that your loved one will never leave you. Let's boil them up and let's drink them down. So, I mean, this one was kind of creepy and that's exactly what I thought and I know it's their culture and it's what they believe but you know what good for them I want no part of this (laughs) I really don't Uh, it makes you wonder and think how how do you get to a point where trying to 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 make sense and and come to, to reality of drinking the dead body 
of your father or your brother or your sister, whatever, is is good. You know, like we talked about how when people die, what was the first thing that came to their minds as watching someone die? What was the first thing that happened in that first death? How do you go from that to to now consuming the dead uh, for for religious reasons? Uh, it's kind of strange. But enough. remember, in some cultures, what it was is that, especially in South American cultures, there is the the belief that like if you consume your enemy, you are con- you are you are keeping them from the other world, and you're also getting their strength. You're taking all of that. So this is a belief that goes across. But the creepy part about this is, it's your 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 tia concha that you're you're drinking. It's not your enemy. It is part of your family. So that's the creepy part of this one. But in in South American cultures and those Indian tribes, this happens. Right. I get it. I, I'm just I, I'm just curious. How do how does it go from okay, someone is dying, and then religious take religions take over and create this ritual? Uh, that fascinates me. How do you get to that point? Um, but anyway, we've got about four minutes left in the show. Um, uh, we probably only got to about 11 stories tonight, maybe 11 or 12. Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure. Um, so definitely warrants another show on the, the scariest stories that we've found. Um, they may not have been the scariest. Um, I'm sure there's hundreds more out there. Um, you guys can search out on your own and find them as well. Um, we found these for tonight's show. We've got more. We've got really interesting uh, stories to, to talk about. So maybe there's going to be a part two to this. So check it out soon. Um, Lucy, why don't you get with the uh, fan of the week? Okay, this week our Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week is again from YouTube. It's another uh, person that has discovered us. And this time it is all the way from melbourne victoria australia and it his name is death head and um he commented on the first video upload where you can actually see us a, a new feature that we're using on youtube and he he sent us this one message and it says anya i don't know what that means anthony and lucy thanks from melbourne victoria australia thank you so much death head for watching and congratulations yeah, thank you. De- I think it's death's head. It's plural. More than one death. I hope you don't go through more than one death. Don't forget, um, congratulations to you. Don't forget, if you want to be a Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week, just uh, like us on Facebook and subscribe to us here on YouTube. Well, you know what? All of these facts that we talked about, we only talked about a few of them. Um, in some parts of the world, remember, some person's normal is very foreign to you. And some of these facts happened years ago, but we're no closer to the truth than when they happened. Are you brave enough to find these answers? Are they real? Are they imagined? Are you ready for the truth? Only you can answer that. Now, a couple of shows back, we did talk about law enforcement's response to a possible Bigfoot sighting. In their line of work, these brave public servants see a lot. So what kind of things do they actually see while on the job? He is the best-selling author of over 50 books. Retired cop Lauren W. Christensen asked men and women in uniform, police officers, sheriff deputies, SWAT, command correction officers, and MP. He asked them about their experiences with the paranormal. These veteran officers have been there, they've done that, but every once in a while they came across something that they could not explain. Lauren has compiled many of these stories into a book, which is called Cops, True Stories of the Paranormal, Ghosts, UFOs, and Other Shivers. Lauren will be joining us next Friday night to share what he and his colleagues have experienced. You really don't want to miss this one. Thank you, everyone, for spending time with us. We're grateful for your love and support. Thank you, Anthony, for another fun Friday night. So, until next week, parapeeps, keep looking for the truth and have a paranormal week. Good night. Good night, everybody. Paranormal Review Radio.